Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, today is Thursday, so it's Jordan Pearson Thursday. We are launching a new series on the uh, personality and its transformations. And as usual, Roger and Claire are leading it. So let me hand it over to them. Over to you, Hi. Roger. All right. Thank you, Shikant, for this invite. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for tonight. So tonight we're going to be talking about Jean Piaget and kind of how his theories first, what their, his theories are, and how, then afterwards, how they relate to Jordan Peterson's theory. We're, I'm gonna be trying to lay out just every now and then a couple of shout outs for maps of meaning. So we kind of keep those connections fresh and you know how he's gonna pull from this later on. Um, in general, I have why Jean Piaget? Well, first and foremost, uh, there's a couple of topics that he really talks about that's both of interest to Jordan Peterson and I think both to me and Claire. Um, but John Piaget had several pretty interesting theories about knowledge structures. In other words, how is it that we know anything or why do we think we know things and how does knowledge work? The second thing is instincts and innate nature think what parts of us come in already pre-programmed within us and what parts are kind of more of the nurturing side. Morality in the sense of how it is should, that we should act and what does psychology have to tell, psychology and especially the development of psychology and knowledge have to tell us about morality. And related to that is games and how children learning to play games can actually tell us a lot about our own psychology and our own morality. He's probably most famous for developing uh, cognitive stages of development. There are four stages, which we'll also be going over. And finally, we're also gonna be discussing the motivations for self-development, why it is that we even have this drive and why do we constantly need to seek to be better. And then finally, we'll explore the direct connection that Peterson brings out from Piaget's theory to his theory of maps of meaning. Uh, anything else you want to sum up before we jump in it, Claire? No, I think that um, for those of you who have been joining us on, on the Peterson journey, um, a lot of, you know, the chapters, especially around children, cognitive development, I mean, a lot of these um, kind of examples that he's going to be going through, are, you know, aren't, you, we may have heard of, but I think that this is really a central idea to Peterson. He's not, you know, a widely known guy. Um, but it, it's really central to a lot of his kind of ideas about cognitive development. Right. So to start off, let's just get a little bit of information about him out of the way. So his name is Jean Piaget. He was born in September 16th, 1996. He's a Swiss psychologist and he's probably most known for creating uh, genetic epistemology. Essentially what that means is it's the study of attempting to understand how we have knowledge or why we have the sensation or idea of knowledge as from a psychological perspective. He's one of the most influential child psychologists um, that's ever been. And we can go ahead and start first. We're going to jump in straight into just some of his theories, like as a whole. These were some of the other videos that didn't have Jordan Pearson in them. And we're just going to walk through them real quick. And if Claire, if you have any comments or anything, just feel free to jump right in. Uh, so the first theory and probably what he's most known for is his um, theory of cognitive development. And for this, he kind of, and we'll get more into this as to how this technically works. But for Piaget, he saw childhood development as a bootstrapping process, as a process in which each iteration is a growing iteration for the next one. And the idea is you, you're starting when you are between zero and two, you're in the first stage. And this stage he called the sensory motor stage. And essentially in this level, you're mostly what you mostly are is actually reflexes and instincts. Um, you're using your senses and the brain becomes um, very interested in kind of just mapping around what, what it even is, right? So it's, you, it's starting to learn its general senses. You're starting to uh, explore and experiment with your, with your reflexes. And eventually, as that's happening, you start to establish as a baby habits. So essentially, you'll do something 
and that causes something novel or new to happen. And now you'll try to do the same thing again. So you can think of it as a, like if a, you give a baby a rattle and it doesn't really know what it's doing and then just moves its hand and then it hears that noise. It's like, well, that was an unexpected thing. It'll continue to keep experimenting with that. And it, it, you'll notice it's trying to actually do the exact same motion over and over again to see if that's a consistent thing. And at this stage, you're essentially just exploring and more importantly, experimenting with reality and with your body. Um, and at this point, this is also when there's still not really a big understanding of the actual surrounding or even really your body. There's no sense of object permanence. This is the peekaboo days where you can hide yourself and then show yourself again. Peterson actually has a great story about that in the lecture, if you saw it. Uh, but this idea that once something's not visible, there's no theory that explains that's like, oh, well, that thing's still there. It's like, oh, well, it's not visible. Well, that whatever the heck that weird stimuli was isn't there anymore. Um, and more, the most important part here is that our, as our mobility increases, as we become more and more mobile, we actually be, our cognitive ability also increases. And it's because we're getting more and more feedback and information through our bodies. And that's actually how our brains are starting to develop. And in this stage, as Peterson would say, I'm just going to put a quick one point on this, but Peterson would say that we're playing out rules without know, knowing anything about them. And did you have anything about that stage that you wanted to throw in or? Yeah, I mean, there's the, the body is the element here and there's sort of an egocentrism to this stage. This is the baby stage is kind of up to two years. Um, and so, you know, this is really just an egocentric body imitating and watching the world. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, most of that time is spent sleeping and eating. So there's this concept of like sucking of the, the, the literal way that this bo the body is interacting, um, is really everything. And that object permanence, the peekaboo, there's no perception of sort of time or these more abstract ideas. Right. And then from there, we kind of start to, you start to transition into the, what Piaget calls the pre-operational uh, stage. This is from between two and seven years old. And here you're, you start to kind of express and under, um, express more symbolic aspects of yourself. They're, like you're starting to get some abstractions, but not very, not very complex ones yet. Uh, you oftentimes will play pretend. So essentially, first you master your body and you do that just by plane essentially and then you look out and you're starting to understand the world at this point you start to develop object permanence you start to understand there are other things and other people in this thing that i'm in and you start to then imitate and mimic the things that you see kind of as a way of trying new possibilities out you're, you're exploring the world but you still don't actually understand what it is you're doing um, around four, this is when there's that transition and you get the why kids, that everything, single thing you say, well, why, 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 right? So, and the reason is they're starting to realize that we're doing all these things, that they've been doing all these things and they have all this actual embodied knowledge, but they don't understand any of it, right? They're like a lot of times you'll be like, well, why do you have to go to work, right? Why do I have to go to school? It's like, I've been going to school, or, but like, I don't understand why I have to go to school. It's like, I've just been doing this. And that's going to be a very key element is this, this idea that a lot of times we'll act first before we ever truly understand anything we're doing. It's only until we reflect back that we can actually even start to extract what it is we're actually doing. Um, they essentially start to notice the structures, but yet don't have a full understanding of what the rules are. They can kind of guesstimate, but it's not very clear from Peterson's perspective. There's a great experiment at this stage where a child is asked, to, there's like a series of blue balls evenly spaced in a row, and the child is asked to replicate them with red balls. And when they do, they'll replicate the size of the line, but the amount of balls or the spacing between them won't matter. So the kind of overall object is visible and there's this, um, he calls it like the intuitive stage. You, you kind of intuit with this larger, but the complexity within it, um, you don't have. And still um, at this stage, you, there's an egocentrism. So you're still, you're not still understanding your interaction with the world. Um, there's a quote of like, asking a brother, if he has a brother, he says yes. And then you say, does Paul, who's his brother, have a brother? And he 
says no. So you're really still only kind of seeing yourself through the word world in these abstractions. Um, and then fantasy, as, as Roger said, is huge here. This is, for me, this was the pretend phase, right? Where everything you're seeing, you're imitating, but then starting to put it in symbols and in stories and uh, the, the line there between reality certainly blurs. Yeah, and uh, very, very good point. Cause at this point, they also don't have a, yeah, they, they see everything still only through their perspective. You can't, they can't quite consider anyone else's. Um, but then that leads to the concrete operational stage, which is between seven and 11. And this is where you start to see kids use logic. This is where they start to get the ability of inductive reasoning. Um, they have more intuitive abstractions. They start to really systematize and organize how they think rather than thinking just being something that happens. Um, I think in this stage, a lot of people oftentimes describe it as waking up or when you know you're, you go from childhood to suddenly you're actually a part of the world and acting within the world rather than the world mostly kind of acting on you. Um, and this is, this is the situation where you start to begin, the, begin to understand the rules that you've been following this whole time. The things as to, well, why does this happen? Why am I doing this? Why do I have to get up at this time? Why do my parents do this? You start to really understand a better, have, you start to build a better theory of the world around you. Yeah, this kind of seven to 11 stage is also when like the ability to do math it like starts to develop because at that stage you can see that two plus two is also three plus one because you can start to break up the individual pieces. The classic experiment here is taking having a child in this stage and you take a glass of water and then you put it into a much narrower glass that's taller and you transfer the water and you say, is it how much water is it is the same amount of water at this stage that child sees it and says i watched that happen i know the glass is taller but i i saw what happened there i can see the kind of complexity within it versus in this earlier stage they would say well it's more it's bigger that seems like it's it's sort of more water um and so you're at this stage you're really developing uh, all that complexity. You're seeing how systems interact with each other and you're seeing how you interact with systems. And that's where morality starts to come into play. And that kind of person moves beyond ego into, into a more moral lens. And then the last stage is the formal operational stage. At this point, this is what Piaget would say some of us are in. Uh, he doesn't believe everyone gets to this point, but uh, it's this idea of the full understandings of abstractions. So abstractions like love, hate, uh, the really abstract things that aren't in any way physical. Um, and we'll get towards the end of this, we'll get into why that's the last stage and how Peterson thinks this works. There's also when you start to get deductive reasoning, which is you start to see certain patterns and then assume a pattern from that, abstract a pattern from that. Uh, this also what allows you to do philosophy because you start to think about thinking. And it's also the abstraction of society as a judge. Uh, I think one of the videos mentioned it as uh, some people start to imagine several people are always watching them, right? And that's this idea of, of the, the public as a judge. And so therefore you become, because you're able to fully consider other people's perspective that the next step then is like okay well what is their perspective of me and that that kind of builds to that to that next level so what does this all mean well it for piaget he kind of points to this idea that um as we naturally develop as children we we're constantly growing our set our skill set and our tools which we're about to get into as far as knowledge structures and kind of how we all developed and got here in the first place. And this is gonna be very important later on as we'll get into. Did you wanna throw anything else in for the last stage? All right. So that's one of the main theories that Piaget brings to the table. Another theory that he brings to the table is his theory of knowledge. And for this one, this is gonna be a little bit hard to explain. So I'm gonna go first and foremost uh, with what Piaget is not. Um, so Piaget is, does not consider himself an empiricist. He 
Uh, I'm going to read a couple quotes from him, from the, the video that, that Shrikant posted. Knowledge is not molded by the things we observe. We always interpret according to our own structures. So for, for Piaget, science cannot provide knowledge as knowledge is the process that occurs only after something has first been interpreted by our unique and individual structure. In other words, the f how we develop and the fact that we all develop in such unique ways requires that we can't then see our observations of the out external world as knowledge because in the end of the day, that knowledge was acquired first and foremost through a filter that we can never get rid of. That's actually, a, that as we'll see later on, is actually a part of us in the most, in the deepest way. It's the very thing that created our psyche is that process. And so he also clarifies that he's not a innatist or a, a priorist, which would be the exact opposite, which would presume that we come in with all this knowledge, that we come in with knowing everything or having a structure for everything. And then as we grow up, it just comes out. And for him, he points out that you can look at mathematics or other complex abstractions. It's like, and they're not innate. They're not carried by us. And he, he actually takes a dig at Noam Chomsky here, who, for those of you that don't know, before he became political, was a very, very famous linguist. Um, and they, Piget and Noam Chomsky had, had quite a disagreement. But uh, he says that if things were innate, then it would, wouldn't just be within every single baby. It would be within all the animals that are evolutionarily close to us. It would be a part of biology as a whole. And, it's, it's, he's, and for him, he sees, sees that as a, just a kind of a ridiculous idea. And but for Piaget, he considers himself a construct a constructivist or a constructionist. And what that means, again quoting him, if knowledge is not preformed in the object or in us, then there is a sequential construction. In other words, it is a slow building construction of knowledge. That is how we actually get to the state we're currently at. We make ourselves as we explore the world and at the same time we make the world as we explore ourselves. So it's this, this dialectic, I guess you could say, is a, almost like a conversation between, and it's that interaction between the person and everything else that creates both the separation of the person as a person and everything else into all its different parts. Did you have something you want to jump in with? Yeah, I think th this idea that really knowledge is always in flux, right? It's always in the state of development. I think what's really interesting about this is it came at a time where most of the other thinkers were like, there was, there was a truth, right? Or Kant, like there is a deeper belief system within us and there's, there, there's a true truths. And while that is true, what PJ is really saying is that's always in, in the process of development and in some time periods more than others. And so then I think what he was really interested in is if that's the only thing we know is that things are developing, then that's where we should be looking, really in the law of the process that is making that development happen and not in the actual truths themselves because those things change as, as we develop as individuals and as a species. Right, and then the last things I had on this were that essentially our intelligence or what it, what gives us intelligence is a series of complex constructions, which require a lot of time for us to develop. And that is why humans have such a long development time, right? Where we don't hit the last stage until, you know, almost a decade over a decade after we were born. Um, but that gives us the advantage of routine building all these routines that allow us to then as Peterson's going to make the case that those routines can then create the abstractions. And Peterson, in a way, is trying to address the mind-body problem here. So why does this matter? For Piaget, this truth is a process rather than a solid fact or a solid interpretation that everyone can agree on. And ideas function more as tools rather than identities, right? There's not, there's not an aspect of like, this is my truth. It's an aspect of this is how I currently, my current theory of the world, but that could easily be wrong and I could just make a new one. So now we're gonna jump into Peterson's view. And for this, we're gonna be referencing those two main theories and we're gonna keep bringing it back into what we already know about Peterson along with some other stuff. So 
the first thing Peterson points out is that Piaget's perspective is quite difficult to actually understand. Uh, the theory of development, not so much, but the actual theory of knowledge is a pretty complex one. Um, and he kind of likens it to Jung in the sense of like how much of a different shift you have to, you have to do quite a shift in how you're seeing things to actually get what the, what the point is. Um, but Peterson does make the point that knowledge is uh, often seen as a fact, not a process. But however, if you think about it, facts do seem to change over time. Even he points out, like if you go to buy, study biology, within a, within a couple of decades, everything that you learned was likely going to be off or wrong. And it's like, well, that's kind of weird because it's not wrong right now. Uh, the world that, so then for Peterson, he kind of sees this as, as facts, as tools rather than realities. Our interpretations are just observations are just, and this is where it's interesting because he starts to kind of walk the line close to postmodernism and, and similar with the, with the criticism of the, you know, the meta text, the idea that everything is subjective, subjective to the interpretation. But this is where it gets, he jumps off from that. Since facts change, since facts change the one thing that doesn't change is the process of the generation of facts. And here's where, Peterson's kind of jumping behind the idea and he's kind of doing what Piaget did and being like, look, okay, so maybe our idea of knowledge and truth gets really obscured because it seems to be more of a process. But what if we can learn that process or learn how that process functions first, then that would actually give us at least some information as to how it is that we come into this knowledge. And therefore, the ultimate fact is the fact about how people generate facts. If that makes sense. And anything you wanted to throw in? Yeah, and that's th that's what's interesting, right? Because that's all that we know to be true. So um, I think that's why he was so fascinated by what watching processes of change that we kind of normally would overlook, and and uh, looking into the complexity of things that the human brain sets, tends to just generalize. All right, so now here's where Peterson kind of takes Piaget's idea of knowledge and also his idea of how children develop and turns it and, use, and uses Jung's psychology to kind of connect the two. Because what he points out is like, look, from Piaget's perspective, it's a cyclical process of constantly engaging with the unknown, integrating something that's valuable from you, like the baby learning that if he has a rattle in his hand and he moves his hand, it makes a fun noise, right? It's like, it's like, okay, I didn't know that was gonna happen. I didn't know what this thing was. If I do certain things with this random sensation, it does this. So every time since we were born, that is the mechanism that drives us to go out to the things we don't know, explore, come back to safety. And for Peterson, he says, that process maps on directly to the hero process, to the hero myth. In the same way, a child has to go past its boundary to ever learn anything, and more importantly, to develop as a human being. That's the exact same process that we've abstracted and mythologized in our hero myths. All the heroes that we have do exactly what every single one of us as a child had to do in order to exist. So then the next thing he says is, is the process of attaining knowledge is therefore embodied in the hero who is the person that notices anomaly, explores it, conquers it, recasts it, or brings it or brings order from it. And from, so did you have anything else you want to throw in there? Yeah, no, I think that there's this, the chart, there's this great chart where there's order and chaos and going in circles. And then where we are oriented is kind of where we are now and what we're aiming or what should be. I, I have that chart if you want to put it up. Yeah, it's great. Um, and, and I think that that it just beautifully represents that, you know, we're these beings, we're in a state and we're moving toward a state always. That, that is a process. And then simultaneously, we're being interacted with chaos. Yeah, this is great. This is even more complex than... Right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this, this one's going to be for one of the later points. But essentially, uh, this is Peterson's idea, general idea of how, 
how we how we create narratives of ourselves. And these two things are actually supposed to represent the same thing. So a good person is essentially a story. And it's a story of what I currently am, how I'm going to get to it, and what I should be. And it's always a constant search for like how I could be a better person. That's your main drive of just wanting to improve. And then he says, but each one of those is a subset of other concepts, such as being a good parent. And then each one of those has a, another sub, subset of, you know, ha, doing good, having a good job, family care. And then each one of those goes down lower and lower. And we'll get more into that. But I just wanted to give you an example of. Yeah, it's, it's great. All right. It's one of yeah. those things, like so much of these concepts where the simpler idea that we all live with is like, know what are the big things in life like know what's important you know there's like that innate thing we all know that you know some things are small and some things are big but what pe but they're all nestled between them and i think there's some quote in this that's like you're juggling a lot of balls you need to know which ones are glass and which ones are rubber and kind of know which ones what which ones you can drop um and and how it all nestles within the greater structure and then the whole thing is also heading toward chaos and order all the time. <laughs> to like add some more complexity to it. Yeah, it's a very, there's, there's a reason his diagrams are a little bit convoluted. <laughs> it's very complex to get it all in one place. Uh, so the next, the next point that he also brings up is the idea of, and this is one of the reasons why I really liked Peterson, but it's the idea of the seeds of biological morality or biologically emergent morality. And what that means is, in philosophy, there's always been a pretty serious problem of the difference of what is and what ought to be. And, you know, certain people like Sam Harris, Peterson points out that like they have a very scientific, realistic point of view. So what you should, what's good and what's bad can be determined just by the facts, just by our understanding of reality as a whole. Um, but Peterson says that Piaget actually provides a, an interesting way out because your abstractions are, he points out that first and foremost, your abstractions are dependent on your body and its structure. So in other words, everything that you believe, there's no soul or anything like that. It's rather everything that you believe, everything that you are is inherently within you. And that's always built in from the start. So therefore, if you follow that logic all the way to the end, it means that most of your knowledge is actually embodied, which makes perfect sense, right? Like almost everything that you actually do you don't have to think about. Almost everything is automated. The only time you have to think about it tends to be when it's something you didn't already expect. That's how we can drive, you know, we can drive all the way to work while talking on the phone, while doing 20 other things, and not actually really be thinking about much. It's all automated processes. So then he says, well, that means that when you're born and you start building your procedural memory, the first stage, uh, those habits that you start to build are habits that you're kind of building the structure like I showed earlier. Um, you're starting to build that structure for of yourself and of the world around you. And essentially you always act first. You experiment with your body to get context, to get shape, and you really can't understand anything else until you fully expand your capacity to move. And Peterson points to the interesting theory. He says, this may explain why you can't remember your inf infancy because you were still barely mapping out your actual body and everything else. And it's not until after you've mapped out your body that you can start to develop your psyche because that, because then you can start to actually explore more, which gives, exposes you to, to more information. And another thing that he points out is, and another thing is though we may come in with some, like a basic toolkit, right? Like your reflexes, instincts, Peterson would also say the archetypes. Though you come in with those basics, um, basic toolkit, it's not enough to get you there. Your parents or whoever's the caretaker puts you in a situation where they essentially determined what you learn. Um, so when a child cries, that's essentially a way to appeal to the adult, to the authority. And almost always that's an indication of, I have no idea what to do. Um, that can be anything from, I have my rattle and then, you know, my little sister comes, my big sister comes and takes it and the child's like, okay, new problem, no idea how to solve this. I'm just going to cry. And then the child learns like, oh, when I cry, if I don't have, if I don't have this problem under control, 
God or whatever it is this thing is comes and just fixes it, right? Or tries to at least, or maybe, you know, depending on what kind of parent you have. But what, what he says, what, what Piaget points out and that Peterson is pointing to is all those norms, all those expectations, all those understandings, all those patterns shape you. They shape you before you can even understand that there's a you, right? Yeah, the, the classic example here is the, I'm sorry to interrupt, the, oh, the, the mouse. So a baby and a mouse walks into a room. The baby doesn't need to know what a mouse is or that the mouse is a mouse, but it's going to look at the parent and see what that parent does. And if the parent reacts with a lot of fear, that's going to incent, that kid is likely going to be afraid of rodents for if that for a long time because that instinct is kind of um, ingrained in that and then we take those take those on to the next stages and in that way that's the constructivist part of this right is you're, you're holding on to the memory the reflexes and what you imitated at first and then actually acted out after right and then all all these learned things are things that you're going to act out be, with n absolutely no understanding of any of the rules or any of the actual games. And Peterson points out the classic example of the wolf pack. And he says, look, why do the wolves seem to have all this behavior that's almost innate within them? It's like, well, because it's built to them in the beginning and then slowly starts to build up as it goes, as it goes on. But, uh, one of the things that he points out is that uh, the behavior in the wolf pack is a set of behaviors that functions as a morality. It's a way of acting in a part of a hierarchy in which your, your function is to maintain yourself as well as the hierarchy you belong in. And at that point, you start to get a true morality. It's basically, what's the best strategy to belong in a group where I'm in a hierarchy, where I'm both serving my own self-interest and the interest of the entire group, because both of those are in my interest to maintain. Which so then- the, the sustainability know. element then of myself and my interaction becomes the basis for morality. Right, and yeah, that was a point I was gonna make later, but I think it's a good point now is, the justification for this isn't so much theoretical as much as the requirement for a game to be stable and sustainable, right? It's just like what's required for a game to continue to be played. It's like, well, it has to at least be sustainable. And that brings us now to games. And for Peterson, he points out, look, there are many ways that we can determine how to uh, interact with each other. And we do plenty of games. There's games as children, there's adult games, but there's also things that we don't really think of as games that function in the exact same way. There's careers, jobs, relationships. And he points out that like almost all these are simulations of the metagame, which is essentially life or existence, right? It's like all these are small, small games nested within a bigger game. And he wants us to conceptualize like that for the, for the reason that we'll get into, but, uh, for here, he kind of points out, he points to the stages of development, and these were just kind of the, the different levels of development as far as games go. And it's at first you play the games unconsciously, then you play them more consciously and you start to have a sense of what is and isn't expected. You see this with kids where they're oftentimes like, that's not fair, or that's not, like they don't know the rules, but they'll say like, you can't do that. It's like, well, why? We haven't discussed rules, right? So it's, it's that, that sense of like, no, something's wrong here. And then they learn the explicit rules. And then the final stages, they learn that they can make the rules. But it you know, doesn't mean that you can just make any rules you want. It means that the rules have to function within a certain morality. But if you can find a rule that fits within a morality, everyone will play a game with you. Uh, Peterson also makes a good, good point here that uh, for Piget to make this this claim, he does have to sacrifice his commitment to direct scientific real, um, realism. Um, that's this claim can't be proven scientifically. So it's always a good thing to consider. Jessica. Yeah, and there's, I mean, from the most basic idea of a kid saying, you know, setting up a pretend and saying, you say this and I say this, and these are the games we're gonna play, all the way through to really the dominance hierarchy of society in which those who do play the game the best get to create the games in the future, right? Or get to create the larger games or get to create others. Um, that the, it's a, it's a sort of, he calls it a functional morality. 
um, and and it, it it has to be in some ways moral or ethical in order to function um, for all the players. And this one was just interesting. I, I was kind of curious what you thought about it, Claire, because um, he talks about people crying in therapy uh, and this idea uh, Peterson says that like from a Freudian standpoint, when you cry, you're rever reverting back to childhood, which actually makes sense, right? If, if the idea is that when you're crying as a child, what you're doing is you're crying for someone else to help you fix the problem because you yourself are out of your element. So things that make you cry essentially are pointing out to a part of you where you think you yourself can't handle it. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can't, but it might be that you yourself see yourself as someone who can't handle it. And that's, it's the sensation of being overwhelmed. And, and that's, that, that's that person that's moving and aiming somewhere facing up against chaos because suddenly there's no sort of map to understand um, and the crying response comes. So I, I definitely can empathize at times where I feel like I'm having a logical or normal conversation and something wells up and it's like, okay, you know, Peterson says in his therapy session, stop, like, let's look at that. Let's really see what was going on there. And obviously we don't know, we don't consciously trace back that that made me think of that when this thought went through my mind, but because we don't know it's chaos. And then as you're saying, Freud would say, we just hit up and against child. Um, Peterson uses the example of his daughter being in the mall and she gets lost for three minutes. And you know, when a little kid gets lost, when they're, when they lose that structure, suddenly what they saw as just a parent being in charge, they can do this, becomes this very complex environment and that she just completely, you know, completely broke down. The younger child was okay because he was looking to the older one and, and that was the hierarchy. Um, but this kind of ascent into chaos is, um, you know, that our mind is just trying to come to terms with it and wrestle with it. And then that's so Peterson, right? Aim at that, look into that, you know, through that comes meaning, et cetera, et cetera. And then he kind of, he brings another Piget idea that I think was really, really good and really interesting because he connects it right. It connects really well with his idea of meaning. And there's a good, uh, kind of general little quote he goes where he's talking to himself, but uh, he's pointing to what, what Piaget called this, this equilibria. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea of, well, why even be motivated to develop? Why, why do we care? And he says, is like this kind of a life is suffering idea. It's like, well, why learn something? Because you're wrong a lot. Who cares if I'm wrong? It makes you suffer. You care. Right. It's, it's the idea of like, if you don't, you will suffer and suffering for Peterson is the most real thing. You can't deny it. Right. If someone's making you suffer, you can say every rational argument you want. You're going to know that that's actually happening to you. And that's, that's the most real sensation that we can get to. And the feeling that that feels like oh. is it, and Peterson uses this a lot is when what is done doesn't produce the intended consequence that you were expecting, right? So there is an unequal distribution of the outcomes that you, you did what you expected and, and yet it didn't come back. And that creates that sort of unequilibrated state. And he, here Peterson also makes a quick case for against Becker's theory of, uh, of, death anxiety and kind of managing death anxiety. And it's this idea that he says, part of the way to over, you overcome suffering is by making the suffering into something meaningful. It's like, and for him, he, you know, if you make a mistake, but you learn from that mistake, there's meaning attached to that. There, there's this sense of you're growing and adapting. And that's kind of what makes the suffering worthwhile. And he, what he points out is like, this isn't you just saving yourself from being scared to die. This is, this is true, genuine adaptation. You make an error that causes suffering, you adapt in such a way so that it doesn't cause suffering in the future. Like that's true and genuine suffering that's been integrated into our system as a whole. And then he kind of points out that when you're, you're always looking for something to learn, there's gotta be some pain on a lot of things. 
but you're always looking to have your learning optimi optimized. And he compares it to surfing. It's like when you're surfing at the right weight, at the right rate, when you're engaged in something meaningful, when it's engaging enough, it's that between order and chaos dynamic that he always talks about. And, oh, all right. And finally, there's two other points I did want to get to real quick. Uh, he talks about games and what the solution for those games then is. And he, Pearson often points out this idea of you'll go up to your kid and you'll, you know, after they've lost the match and you'll say, hey, man, it's, it's not about winning it's, or losing. It's about how you play the game. And then your kid will look at you and ask, what do you mean? And then you'll realize you don't know what he means. And Peterson kind of says, like, that's the point of that is that the meta skill you can learn from playing games is that you can play a game in such a way that it makes it more likely for the game to occur again. And if you do that, rather than just trying to win the single competition, what you've won is more opportunities to both grow and win that same competition. It's a more optimal solution. And then he says, it's like, well, what's the, what's the best way to play all these games? And that's where we bring in Piaget's equilibrated state. The idea of if you can play a game at that when is played is at least stable and does not degenerate, does not fall apart through across time, that's an equilibrated state. An optimal state would be one in which each iteration improves. But those are two, two at least ideal solutions for that game, which then also translates to a morality, which I think is a very interesting build, build to make. Can you ex explain it one more time? Yeah, yeah. So, it's very confusing. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So whenever we play any game, right, there's only a couple requirements there's a couple of requirements that you would want to do if you're trying to play a game that wouldn't fall apart because that's kind of seen as the, for Piaget and for Peterson, like that's actually the bare minimum, right? Any other game that falls apart is not, is a suboptimal solution to this. So any game that's going to be equilibrated has to not fall apart. Everyone has to want to play it and it has to always be the same, uh, it basically has to be a game that you can play over and over and over again, and it doesn't get old, doesn't fall apart. And then there's a, a more ideal version, like a heaven on earth situ scenario, where instead of just not falling apart, each time the game is played, things get better, right? Because then not only is everyone invested in playing, but then everyone gets better as you play the game. Does that make sense? So that So that is like the... The, the sum of all, all the games being played. Right. So, so the next, the, the one other thing I do want to point to is that you remember that Piaget's final development is the realization that we can make the games and we can make the rules. So therefore the goal should be to create a game or one goal that could, that might be worthwhile is to create a game that at least doesn't degenerate across time. And then the perfect version of that is create a game that improves across each iteration. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And then the last one, which is, this is more just setting things up for uh, maps of meaning, is that little thing I shared. Can everyone see this? Perfect. Okay. So a lot of times we tend to, th like at least I used to think, Ideas like good person, good parent, good job were things that uh, we learned the concepts first and then we fill them in with like what we see across the world. But both Peterson and Piaget make the exact opposite claim. What they say is like, no, no, no. When you're first born, all these little subsets are where you start. You don't have access to any of this stuff. And if you notice, as you get lower and lower down this uh, hierarchy of concepts, they become more and more physical. And the idea is that every single concept you have eventually breaks down to an actual physical embodied behavior or action. And that's actually where you built yourself. So the, the idea is that first you start, you first still just start down here and slowly through actions, 
build yourself into a couple of these sets of behaviors, which then eventually get abstracted into narratives, which then all these behaviors together create a more complex concept. And then all these together create a more complex concept. So it's this idea of like, okay, well, what's a good parent? Someone who does family, someone who has a good job, someone who's loyal to their uh, you know, wife or husband, someone who, you know, and you have all these different breakdowns, but all of those are, are, are held up by other beliefs. Um, later we can talk about this, but this is also, this is a general diagram of what you believe. So if you are told, if like, for example, someone, <laughs> you go and play peekaboo with a child and you just keep scaring them and your partner comes and says, you're a bad person, at that point, they're taking out this entire thing, which means everything under it also collapses. That's why we don't like being called that. That's why we don't like being called anything that's high abstractions. Because it's not just this. If, if, this was, if they're actually right and we want to believe them, if we're not a good person, then we're not a good parent. We're also not good at our job. We're also not good at family care. We're definitely not good at playing with the baby. We're not good at completing meals. We're not good. Everything starts to collapse. And that's one of the reasons why our beliefs about ourselves that we've developed over a lot of time and are a lot of effort to build, we get very, very defensive anytime anyone questions this. And that's going to be a key point for when we get into maps of meaning and when we get into ideologies and like political beliefs and moral beliefs, as well as religious beliefs. This is, this is definitely an aha moment for me because I don't think I realize like this is also why clean your room makes sense, right? So right. If, if you break this down to the individual actions as you're saying on the lower sense and just like as you're saying how can you make the best larger overarching game or world by perfecting those smaller games and making those all as optimal as possible and that working kind of up yeah one thing that's really really good uh, that i've done with several friends um just for funsies that had like struggled with self-confidence we mapped this entire thing out so like I would map is like, what's the most important things you identify as and then break down what each one of those are. And then we just keep going until they're actual actions. And once they're actions, I give them like a, like one of these where they can just tag them. And I'll be like, okay, you think you're a bad person or a bad friend or whatever. Mark what things you're actually failing at. And that helps them highlight what things are they're actually failing at as opposed to just taking the entire thing out, which is much more emo of an emotional burden. But think, you know, like kind of conceptualizing like that really helps. So essentially for Piaget, he takes that constructionist point of view and that's what he means by that, that like behaviors are what then shape more complex sets of behaviors, which sets, sets of behaviors, which then shape more complex sets of behaviors, which then eventually develop into abstractions. And for Peterson, he's kind of making the point that like, that's how our mind and body are connected. We create our mind through abstractions, but those abstractions eventually are extremely complex, constructed, sequentially learned patterns of behavior. So, yeah, I got, uh, yeah, that's, I got some key takeaways, but I think I pretty much just hit most of them. So I think we can, we can open it for questions. All right, folks. So it's time for questions. Uh, in order to ask questions, go ahead and We've got four rules. Number one, keep on topic. Number two, be brief. Number three, feel free to please speak your mind. Feel free to disagree with anybody on anything, but do so courteously. And number four, in order to speak, just type exclamation mark in the chat. So it's going to be Dave from Tacoma, Joe, uh, Steve, Aaron, and David. Dave, go ahead. Uh, Dave, you need to unmute. Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> it's, it's always something. Anyway, thanks, Rakan, and Roger and Claire. Good job, as usual. Uh, I did get all the way through his lecture, and the thing with the rats was fascinating. Uh, not the rat ran across the floor, but the rats playing together, the one was dominant. Where they would learn that he had to let the little guy win 30% of the time, and that was just so revealing. And of course, then the kind of side remark of that we study rats and then stared at the college students, which isn't that much below you, but uh, to me that was fascinating. 
Yeah, no, like I love that that example and that story because essentially it's, I mean, it is direct evidence for even rats having some sense of how things should play out, right? Like, it's like, all right, I sh why would I keep coming to you if you're just going to beat me up every time? I'm not learning anything and like you're not gaining anything either. And this idea of like, nah, that's not fair. I don't want to play this game. And the story, just for anyone who hasn't heard it, is that uh, when rats are having competitions or playing games, 30% of the time, the, if there's a winning rat, he has to let the other rats win. Um, the other classic example of this is the winning wolf is going to have to expose their belly at the end. So that vulnerability, or literally you have to let someone win in order to keep playing the game. And we know, we know that's, that's why the LeBrons of the world just seem a little bit unfair when you're not joining it with some sportsmanship. Um, and in there lies um, that kind of implicit morality. Yeah, it's that general assumption that there seems to be rules to a game that nobody, but nobody seems to understand the rules. Uh, next up is Joe. Joe, go ahead. Um, hi, Roger and Claire. Thank you uh, for presenting this evening. This was actually this is excellent, um, especially at the end that put a lot of things together for me. Um, but I do have one question. You'd mentioned that there had been a disagreement between Chomsky and Piaget. Like, what could you go into that a little bit more deeply at all? And if you can't, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit off. But I do yeah. think because I, I, I look at language as being critical to this process and understanding like what, you know, they're, how they're, you know, uh, how we interact with the world and processes in general and schemas. So, you know, I'm trying to understand what they disagreed on and then maybe I can piece this together a little bit more. Yeah. I'll, I'll fully admit I'm kind of reaching and going out of my element here. So forgive me if what I'm saying isn't nearly as, precise or as accurate as I would like it. But from what I can remember, Chomsky's main argument is that the framework for language is innate. In other words, our grammatical structure for how we create a language is innate within humans themselves. So we come with the, we come basically set up pre-made with certain structures already to be able to speak a language. Whatever language that is, you know, that's determined to, you know, by ourselves. But every single language seems to still have the same basic grammatical structure. Even if the rules tend to switch, we still require the exact same structure. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, Stephen, Aaron, uh, David, and Marisa. Stephen, go ahead. Hi. Good evening. That was certainly a, a complicated lecture and you simplified it very well. I could have watched it two or three more times to get really get it. But my question is somewhat of a uh, segue from Dave's about games and the nature of games. Um, and Claire, you acknowledged that and gave the right example how um, one has to win in order to be invested in the game um but my so my question is twofold is game um an analogy for something larger or is it something um or is it something that you typically think of when we think of games and um is uh to your point roger about them degenerating is that if in the case where if one is always winning or, or not doing their the best they can do that they won't be invested in it is that so those are my questions so um the first question is game significant i mean i think it first of all it's just games it, it, what is it meant by games yeah what? so at the very basic level, it is the games we play as children. When we say, you're going to do this, I'm going to do this. We're going to play tag. We're going to play Marco Polo. And that evolves into sports. I mean, those are, they're, they're literal, the games, the, but they're also symbolic because what we're doing when we're playing those literal games as children is we're, we're acting out the greater game of life, which is sort of the hierarchy. 
which is made up of lots of little individual games that we're playing. We're playing a game at work. We're playing, you know, we're, we're playing a game with our, in our relationships. We're navigating through sort of the greater game. Um, so there is a sim symbolism there. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, and I would also just highlight, like we are playing a game currently, right? Mm -hmm. We're all taking turns talking. No one's naked. Uh, we all are doing, we're all acting reasonable and that none of, none of these rules have been expressed, right? Like a lot of these are just kind of understood as like, well, those are just the rules of this game. And if you break them, we don't want to be around you, right? Um, and for the second game, yeah, I think the, the mice one is a perfect example of a degenerating game. Uh, if, the, if a mouse is 10% larger than its competition, it can always, it can win almost every dominance challenge. If that mouse chooses not to let the the, the submissive mouse uh, win in any of its little practice rounds, well, then the submissive mouse stops playing and the game just stops happening, right? It's, a de it's degenerated. Another good example is psychopaths. Psychopaths don't have a regard for the game. That's why most people genuinely don't like them, mostly because they, they'll just tear the game apart and go for everything that they can for themselves with no regard for anyone else, or more importantly, the structure that allowed them to even do that in the first place. Next up Thank is you. going to be Aaron. Aaron, go ahead. Uh, awesome presentation, guys. It really took me back to my uh, Psych 101 days. So thank you for condensing all that material into a single lecture. I kind of have a question about the concrete, uh, the, the stage of development from concrete to formal operations. And I know, Roger, you had mentioned that some people don't ever make it to the formal operational stage. And this is actually something I've wondered myself when I first learned this in college is like, why is that exactly? Is it like a lack of education? Is, is it an intelligence thing? Like why, why are some people not able to really, um, at, you know, obtain this really high level of abstract reasoning. I'm wondering what the reasons are for that. I, yeah, I, Peter, I think Peterson touches on it and he just says that there's a lot of debate over that. Um, one of, another question that he also says is a lot of debate as like whether they're all required or necessary or whether you could speed them up. Um, but yeah, as far as official actual answers, there's not really one. If I had to make a random guess, I would likely say the environment doesn't require it of some people mm. um like if you're if you're someone that's you know doesn't tend this low neuroticism doesn't tend to have a lot of negative emotions and you've already built a routine where like your current developmental stage is enough to get you through life and there's no challenge or need to adapt or change well then you just there's no reason for you to do it so you just don't do it right like mm. so you just kind of get you just stay in that cycle. And that's if that cycle is good enough and you're content within that cycle, there's no need to bring in, you know, like philosophizing about the world <laughs> and like trying to find meaning in your life. Like, you know, there, there's just so many other situations that may lend itself to be more important than that. Uh, that's a good look. Thank you. Uh, next up is David, Maritza and Mamta. David, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. And thanks very much, Roger, again, for a very interesting talk. So I wanted to follow up on two things with uh, Jordan Peterson. One, as you were talking with Piaget and Jordan Peterson uh, about this focus in life to be a good person. And you described that, that diagram that you and Claire were discussing. And then Jordan Peterson also has discussed a lot about dominance. I was wondering, is there any comment from Peterson or Piaget is what's the actual goal of people? Is it that being good helps you to be dominant or they want to be a good person and therefore dominance allows them to be a good person or they want to be a good person and dominant and you know they want to be dominant and being good helps them to be dominant? Yeah, I, from, I'm not too sure on Piaget. I think both Piaget, well actually I don't know about Piaget but I know that Peterson would likely say the actual values or goal hierarchies are I mean, they're very independent from person to person. There's no direct one thing that everyone cares about, but structurally he would say that there's big incentives and motivational incentives for us to 
climb the hierarchy and for us to um, take care of our children. But those are more instincts than actual like abstract conceptualizations of what we want to do with our life. But so like, I don't, I'm, yeah, like, I don't know. Cause, because there's also different people that like, I don't think he'd even say climbing the hierarchy. Cause I don't think that always works for everyone. I think because he's a big fan of temperament and, and personality, uh, he points out himself that like people that are CEOs are the type of people that just have to win at everything. And they're, they're obsessed with climbing the hierarchy and like, naturally those are the people that would actually put all the effort and do everything that you need to do to get that up there. And it's like, yeah, all right, dude, you're at the top, you're the king. But it's this idea of like, that doesn't necessarily work for most. And most of us tend to find meaning in a lot of other things. So he, he would, he kind of leave that part of like what it is that we all want as a very like that on depending on too many variables. And I, I'm not, I'm not sure about Piget. Okay. Uh, next up is going to be Maritza. Maritza, go ahead. I, I'm apologizing in advance. I may be having some computer issues today. Um, so I have a question. There, there are two major concepts uh, discussed here by um, Peterson that I find to be almost contradictory. So I'm curious to see what your thoughts on it are and maybe if you can shed a little light. So, you know, when he's talking about um, the constructivist ideas, he's saying, you know, you take whatever's there and you sort it into the you and into the world. And, but then when, when he adds in the concept of the play circuit in mammals, which is what you were just describing with the, um, the, uh, the built-in sense of fair play, right? Whereas the, the almost biological imperative is that um, if the little rat doesn't see that they win at least 30% of the time, they're not gonna go and invite the, the big rat to play anymore. And, and so that's that concept gives us evidence of biological um, instantiation of a complex morality. Like, so what he says is, even if you can win every time, well, then you shouldn't. But then if, if that's a morality that's built in with us, how do we reconcile that with the concept of being able to, you know, we have a conception of ourselves where we build our own behaviors before we act upon the representation that we've built. It feels to me a little bit like there's some, maybe it's a contradiction, but it might just be the way I'm visualizing it. So could you elaborate a little bit on where you, where, where you, where you feel the contradiction is? So if, if I'm, so he states it. So he, he states it doesn't matter when or, whether you win or lose. It's all in how we play the game. But then he's telling me the game is rigged, because he's saying that if my if there's a built-in biological imperative where I have a, a, a ethical morality, well then it's not exactly a true statement because I have a predisposition to want to actually not win a certain percentage of the time, right? Okay, yeah, so the, I, I think I, I get what you're saying. So essentially what you're saying is, if we're all just being built by these things and then there's also this inherent morality, then by necessity, that's a morality that we're already kind of predestined to, to do. Is that what you're trying to point out to? But that, that's what I, I think I'm seeing here. I'm not sure okay. if I'm understanding that correctly. Yeah, yeah. so real quick, just to, to make a quick distinction. Uh, so what Peterson is essentially claiming here is that the, that the emergent morality isn't so much within the individual, but rather the game. And in order to play the game and to keep the game sustained, then you have to play and learn those rules. And then that's kind of what gets taken in. But it's not necessarily, it's, it's an emergent morality from the social interaction. It's not an emergent morality that's directly inherited. Does that make sense? It's, an, it's inherited, but it's inherited within our social domain, not a biological so much. Because he actually says the word biological. Right. Well, it's, it's biological because everything that's in play is biological, but it's, uh, ah. 
Okay. Does that make sense? Like it's like, okay. it, it, does, it doesn't come from an abstractive sense. It comes from the social dynamics that we have to play where we count on each other. But the only way that we can count on each other for a long period of time is if we all follow these invisible rules that we have that no one's played. And, you know, a good example of people that don't do that is people that aren't socialized, right? That's why they're antisocial is they can't be in a social setting. They won't follow the social rules. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. Uh, next up is uh, Mamata, uh, Tricia, and John. Mamata, go ahead. Okay, I don't have a question except uh, Sanjay has already answered. It was about the mirror neurons. Uh, I think they are high in HSV, uh, but what about the other people? Uh, children have, uh, my question was and still is, I need clarification here. Why the children have lots of mirror neurons and they, uh, they lose uh, depending upon their persona because sociopaths and psychopaths, they don't have mirror neurons to my knowledge. That's it. Okay, um, Sanjay, would you like to answer the question? I know that you are very knowledgeable on mirror neurons. Would you like to take that? Sure, I can try. I mean, so mirror neurons are actually much more basic than um, what Mamta, what you're describing. What you're describing are, are more social situations and, and behaviors, higher level behaviors. Um, mirror, mirror neurons, basically, they, what, what they're doing is they're, they're um, they're very simple structures in our brain where when we, when a baby or when we as an adult um, see something, and it's not only through our, our visual sense, it can be through other senses. When we experience something outside of us, um, our brain tries, those mirror neurons try to mimic the same types of um, behavior. They, they try to get other structures in our brain to mimic the same thing. Um, it's most easily seen in, in visual behavior. When, for example, a parent makes a face to a, to a baby to an infant and the infant tries to make the same face. That's that's basically driving the mirror neurons. They're, they're rarely, um, I mean, I don't think, I, I'm not aware that they're uh, involved in, in higher socialized behaviors as you're talking about in um, highly sensitive people and, and uh, psychopaths. I mean, psychopaths are explained other ways. We don't have to use mirror neurons to explain them. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. Um, Tricia is asking, uh, a variation or elaboration on the same question, the same great question that Maritza brought up. I want to say just one thing about it. And Tricia, you want to uh, phrase your question again? Just wanting to understand um, basically if the premise is that you need to keep the game sustainable. And then another premise is if someone keeps winning, it's not sustainable is the conclusion then that winners need to sabotage themselves? And if not, what would be the mechanism of ensuring that the game is sustained if you are in fact a winner? Uh, Roger and Claire, may I address the question? Yeah. Okay, um, see, I, see, this is a very interesting question. This is the same question. I think this is uh, beautiful because this is really kind of goes to the heart of nature of civilization because it is or you know nature of civilization and nature of biology even the interesting thing about this the mouse game is that you can see the same trade-offs operating even you know pre-human stage the point is this it is in our interest i'm talking about it from human perspective now okay it is in our interest that we play a game where everybody wants to play. Everybody wants to play with us. That's a very big thing because there is a lot to be gained by playing with many people. Um, if you're not able to play, if, if you set up a game or start behaving in a way where it is not in the interest of other people to play with you, you're pretty much lost. I mean, that's, that's a fundamental value, okay? Then once there is that basic level of fair play. In that context, you can, you can play a game where you do better than other people. So I think it's in the general win-win context that that win-lose thing uh, can work. But that's what I think, that, that that's the lesson that I see. Roger. 
Yeah, I just also want to kind of add in the the simple fact of reality that no matter how good of a winner you are for one game, that you were never only playing one game. Beautiful. So, yeah. Right. So the idea is like, if if like when I was a kid, I was taller than everyone by a lot. I'm six four. I could easily beat the. I could easily win the dominance game against any other kid very very quickly. It's like, but then the only thing that that would actually achieve is no one else wants to play with me, right? Like I'm the jerk. So it's, it's like, even if you're really good at one game, that doesn't necessitate you'll be good at other games. Right. And that, let, let me elaborate. This is a beautiful point. See, we evolved in the a tribe of about 30 people. Okay. And these are our family. These are the people we depend on for everything. Okay. Now you may be better at somebody on this one thing. Okay. But if you play it in a way where they don't want to play with you, they, they, don't want, they don't want to cook for you, or they don't want to share something, they don't want to tell you something that you, you would, it would be in your interest to know, then you have lost a lot more than whatever the value you gained from the game. So it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of calculation across games and across people and across time. And that's what you're trying to maximize. So every other kind of the game and winning and losing is taking place in that general context. And this calls back to the rule of comparison, right? That because we're all playing a unique set of games that is unique to us and also the, the constructivist history that got our own viewpoint to where it is today, then it's completely illogical to compare yourself to someone else who's playing a different set of games and is in a different hierarchy because theirs is unique. Excellent. Um, uh, great questions, Marisa and uh, Tricia. Uh, next up is John. Hey, yeah, so you guys basically said mostly what I was going to comment on, although obviously like, I'm not saying that I would have had the same thoughts. <laughs> but uh, so I, I, just, I, gotta, like, I guess I would like to tie it to um, one of the other things you said, which I think is related to this is uh, how he describes, or how Peterson describes P PJ's idea of being a good person. And that, like, he, I think he describes it as a box, right? And it's, it's sort of not just a box with things in it. It's sort of a box that you have to learn. It's it, the, 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 the abstraction of good person is the learned skill of being able to put things in the box continually that foster a good person. And I thought this was a really beautiful way to describe it and that uh, being a good person is not just a thing you achieve or not just, you know, I think he describes like making broccoli is, you know, learning to chop broccoli, but like the ability to continually nurture that. Um, and I thought that was a really sort of interesting and beautiful point. Yeah, because the, the other abstraction that occurs within it is sort of time and the ability that this goes into shrink your timeline, right? So the ability to make preparing a dinner or whatever it is into um, the different levels of complexity by really seeing them. And that's where you get into flow state, right? Or even meditation of by really being in a, in a location um, or, or seeing the complexity and, you know, it's, it's, it's never ending. You can keep zooming in forever. Right. And you sort of have to continually keep learning how to be a good person. Like you don't, it's not like you just say, okay, like I, I'm a good parent and I'm a good, you know, I have a good job and now I'm a good person. That's it. You know, it's sort of like, you have to like keep, you have to, you have to learn that skill of discovering what it means to be a good person and then keep putting the good person stuff in the box continually, right. which I thought was really great. Yeah. So, because it's kind of the ultimate abstraction. A good person is like the person that you would ideally like to be, which like, once you get there, well, what do, would you like to be now? It's like, well, you need a, a next step to kind of keep that going. Okay, uh, last question is by Stefan, and then we're going to do breakout rooms um, for about 25 minutes, and then we will come back to share our takeaways. Then we'll look at all the themes from the takeaways and talk about what, what themes emerge from that. So Stefan, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I'm not sure if this was mentioned yet, but this reminds me a lot about what Peterson said. I don't, uh, I don't remember the exact. Yeah. Uh, could you talk more into the mic? It's difficult to hear. 
Uh, yeah, I don't remember if, is this better? Much better. Okay. So I'm not sure if this is what, um, or if this was mentioned yet, but this reminds me of something that Peterson said about how one of the best things you can do in life is to be invited to as many games as possible. So that would be a good incentive to let people win sometimes because then you're invited to more games and then you build your social circle, your skill set probably, and you just keep on evolving. So it's in your interest to, even if you're <laughs> like some Uberman, super good at everything, it's best to let people win because then you win overall as you progress through life. Yeah, and I think there's definitely, it's definitely a reflection of like, was it rule five? Um, the and the idea being that if you teach, this is why it's so important to teach your children or to socialize your children correctly is if you teach them how to be liked by other people, other primates, then those other people will then show them everything they want. They'll include them in the knowledge that they have, which is more than you or anyone else could teach them, especially if they get really good at being social, then they're expanding all the different sources of knowledge. And if they know how to be social, everyone enjoys sharing what they know. And then because of that, they have this huge resource, not to mention they also have that relationship, right? So it's, yeah, it's a super beneficial and, and it's an exponential return if you're fun to play with. If you're, if you're more fun to play with than good. Wonderful. So on that note, uh, let's go to breakout rooms um, for 25 minutes and then we'll be back here to share our takeaways.